Chapter Thirteen of *The Doings of Raffles Haw* by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Midnight Venture. Not a word was said to Laura when she returned as to the scene which occurred in her absence. She was in the gayest of spirits and prattled merrily about her purchases and her arrangements, wondering from time to time when Raffles Haw would come. As night fell, however, without any word from him, she became uneasy. "'What can be the matter that he does not come?' she said. "'It is the first day since our engagement that I have not seen him.' Robert looked out through the window. "'It's a gusty night and raining hard,' he remarked. "'I do not at all expect him.' "'Poor Hector used to come rain, snow, or fine. "'But then, of course, he was a sailor. "'It was nothing to him.' I hope that Raffles is not ill. He was quite well when I saw him this morning, answered her brother, and they relapsed into silence while the rain pattered against the windows and the wind screamed amid the branches of the elms outside. Old McIntyre sat in the corner most of the day biting his nails and glowering into the fire with a brooding malignant expression upon his wrinkled features. Contrary to his usual habits, he did not go to the village inn, but shuffled off early to bed without a word to his children. Laura and Robert remained chatting for some time by the fire, she talking of the one thousand and one wonderful things which were to be done when she was mistress of the new hall. There was less philanthropy in her talk when her future husband was absent, and Robert could not but remark that her carriages, her dresses, her receptions, and her travels in distant countries were the topics into which she threw all the enthusiasm which he had formerly heard her bestow upon refuge homes and labor organizations. "'I think the greys are the nicest horses,' she said. "'Bays are nice, too, but greys are more showy. We could manage with a brogom and a landau, and perhaps a high dog-cart for raffles. He has the coach-house full at present, but he never uses them, and I am sure that those fifty horses would all die for want of exercise.' or get livers like Strasbourg geese if they waited for him to ride or drive them. "'I suppose that you will still live here,' said her brother. "'We must have a house in London as well, and run it for the season. I don't, of course, like to make suggestions now, but it will be different afterwards. I am sure that Raffles will do it if I ask him. It is all very well for him to say that he does not want any thanks or honors, but I should like to know... What is the use of being a public benefactor if you are to have no return for it? I am sure that if he does only half what he talks of doing, they will make him a peer, Lord Tamfield, perhaps, and then, of course, I shall be my Lady Tamfield, and what would you think of that, Bob? She dropped him a stately curtsy and tossed her head in the air, as one who was born to wear a coronet. Father must be pensioned off, she remarked presently, he shall have so much a year on condition that he keeps away. As to you, Bob, I don't know what we shall do for you. We shall make you president of the Royal Academy, if money can do it. It was late before they ceased building their air castles and retired to their rooms, but Robert's brain was excited, and he could not sleep. The events of the day had been enough to shake a stronger man. There had been the revelation of the morning, the strange sights which he had witnessed in the laboratory and the immense secret which had been confided to his keeping. Then there had been his conversation with his father in the afternoon, their disagreement, and the sudden intrusion of Raffles Haw. Finally, the talk with his sister had excited his imagination, and driven sleep from his eyelids. In vain he turned and twisted in his bed, or paced the floor of his chamber. He was not only awake, but abnormally awake, with every nerve highly strung, and every sense at the keenest. What was he to do to gain a little sleep? It flashed across him that there was brandy in the decanter downstairs, and that a glass might act as a sedative. He had opened the door of his room, when suddenly his ear caught the sound of slow and stealthy footsteps upon the stairs. His own lamp was unlit, but a dim glimmer came from a moving taper, and a long black shadow travelled down the wall. He stood motionless, listening intently. 
The steps were in the hall now, and he heard a gentle creaking as the key was cautiously turned in the door. The next instant there came a gust of cold air. The taper was extinguished, and a sharp snap announced that the door had been closed from without. Robert stood astonished. Who could this night wanderer be? It must be his father. But what errand could take him out at three in the morning? And such a morning, too! With every blast of the wind, the rain beat up against his chamber window, as though it would drive it in. The glass rattled in the frames, and the tree outside croaked and groaned as its great branches were tossed about by the gale. What could draw any man forth upon such a night? Hurriedly, Robert struck a match and lit his lamp. His father's room was opposite his own, and the door was ajar. He pushed it open and looked about him. It was empty. The bed had not even been laid in. The single chair stood by the window, and there the old man must have sat since he left them. There was no book, no paper, no means by which he could have amused himself, nothing but a razor strop lying on the window still. A feeling of impending misfortune struck cold to Robert's heart. There was some ill meaning in the journey of his father's. He thought of his brooding of yesterday, his scowling face, his bitter threats. Yes, there was some mischief underlying it, but perhaps he might even now be in time to prevent it. There was no use calling Laura. She would be no help in the matter. He hurriedly threw on his clothes, muffled himself in his top coat, and, seizing his hat and stick, set off after his father. As he came out into the village street, the wind whirled down it, so that he had to put his ear and shoulder against it and push his way forward. It was better, however, when he turned into the lane. The high bank and the hedge sheltered him upon one side. The road, however, was deep in mud, and the rain fell in a steady swish. Not a soul was to be seen, but he needed to make no inquiries, for he knew whither his father had gone as certainly as though he had seen him. The iron side gate of the avenue was already half open, and Robert stumbled his way upon the graveled drive amid the dripping fir trees. What could his father's intention be when he reached the hall? Was it merely that he wished to spy and prowl, or did he intend to call up the master and enter into some discussion as to his wrongs? Or was it possible that there was some blacker and more sinister design lay beneath his strange doings? Robert thought suddenly of the razor strop and gasped with horror. What had the old man been doing with that? He quickened his pace to a run and hurried on until he found himself at the door of the hall. Thank God all was quiet there. He stood by the big silent door and listened intently. There was nothing to be heard save the rain and the wind. Where, then, could his father be? If he wished to enter the hall, he would not attempt to do so by one of the windows, for had he not been present when Raffles Haw had shown them the precautions which he had taken? But then a sudden thought struck Robert. There was one window which was left unguarded. Haw had been imprudent enough to tell them so. It was the middle window of the laboratory. If he remembered it so clearly, of course his father would remember it too. There was the point of danger. The moment that he had come around the corner of the building, he found that his surmise had been correct. An electric lamp burned in the laboratory, and the silver squares of the three large windows stood out clearly and bright in the darkness. The center one had been thrown open, and, even as he gazed, Robert saw a dark monkey-like figure spring up onto the sill and vanish into the room beyond. For a moment only it outlined itself against the brilliant light beyond, but in that moment Robert had space to see that it was indeed his father. On tiptoe he crossed the intervening space and peeped in through the open window. It was a singular spectacle which met his eyes. There stood upon the table some half-dozen large ingots of gold, which had been made the night before, but which had not been removed to the treasure-house. On these the old man had thrown himself, as one who enters into his rightful inheritance. He lay across the table, his arms clasping the bars of gold, his cheek pressed against them, crooning and muttering to himself. Under the clear, still light, amid the giant wheels and strange engines, that one little dark figure clutching and clinging to the ingots had in it something both weird and piteous. 
For five minutes or more Robert stood in the darkness amid the rain, looking in at this strange sight, while his father hardly moved save to cuddle closer to the gold, and to pat it with his thin hands. Robert was still uncertain what he should do, when his eyes wandered from the central figure and fell on something else which made him give a little cry of astonishment, a cry which was drowned amid the howling of the gale. Raffles Haw was standing in the corner of the room. Where he had come from, Robert could not say, but he was certain that he had not been there when he first looked in. He stood silent, wrapped in some long, dark dressing gown, his arms folded, and a bitter smile upon his pale face. Old McIntyre seemed to see him at almost the same moment, for he snarled out an oath, and clutched still closer at his treasure, looking slantwise at the master of the house with furtive, treacherous eyes. "'And it has come to this,' said Haw, at last taking a step forward. "'You have actually fallen so low, Mr. McIntyre, as to steal into my house at night like a common burglar. You knew that this window was unguarded. I remember telling you as much, but I did not tell you what other means I have adopted by which I might be warned if knaves made an entrance, but that you should have come, you. The old gunmaker made no attempt to justify himself, but he muttered some few hoarse words and continued to cling to his treasure. I love your daughter, said Raffles Haw, and for her sake I will not expose you. Your hideous and infamous secret shall be safe with me. No ear shall hear what has happened this night. I will not, as I might, arouse my servants and send for the police, but you must leave my house without further words. I have nothing more to say to you. Go as you have come. He took a step forward and held out his hand as if to detach the old man's grasp from the golden bars. The other thrust his hand into the breast of his coat and with a shrill scream of rage flung himself upon the alchemist. So suddenly and so fierce was the movement that Haw had no time for defense. A bony hand gripped him by the throat, and the blade of a razor flashed in the air. Fortunately, as it fell, the weapon struck against one of the many wires which spanned the room, and flying out of the old man's grasp, tinkled upon the stone floor. But, though disarmed, he was still dangerous. With a horrible, silent energy, he pushed Haw back and back until, coming to a bench, they both fell over it, McIntyre remaining uppermost. His other hand was on the alchemist's throat, and it might have fared ill with him had Robert not climbed through the window and dragged his father off of him. With the aid of Haw, he pinned the old man down and passed a long cravat around his arms. It was terrible to look at him, for his face was convulsed, his eyes bulging from his head, his lips white with foam. Haw leaned against the glass table, panting, with his hand to his side. "'You hear, Robert?' he gasped. "'Is it not horrible? How did you come?' I followed him. I heard him go out. He would have robbed me, and he would have murdered me, but he is mad, stark, staring mad. There could be no doubt of it. Old McIntyre was sitting up now, and burst suddenly into a hoarse peal of laughter, rocking himself backwards and forwards, and looking up at them with little twinkling, cunning eyes. It was clear to both of them that his mind, weakened by long brooding over the one idea, had now become that of a monomaniac. His horrid, causeless mirth was more terrible even than his fury. "'What shall we do with him?' asked Ta. "'We cannot take him back to Elmdene. It would be a terrible shock to Laura. We could have doctors to certify in the morning. Could we not keep him here until then? If we take him back, someone will meet us, and there will be a scandal. I know. We will take him to one of the padded rooms, where he can neither hurt himself nor anyone else. I am somewhat shaken myself, but I am better now.' Do you take one arm, and I will take the other. Half leading, half dragging him, they managed between them to convey the old gunmaker away from the scene of his disaster, and to lodge him for the night in a place of safety. At five in the morning, Robert had started in the gig to make the medical arrangements, while Raffles Haw paced his palatial house with a troubled face and a sad heart. End of chapter 13